up to questions from you all, and I think someone has a mic to, um, does, let's see, um, Cynthia. leads on right to what you were talking about. Renee, you've lived this struggle every day. Jeff tends to speak himself into that struggle by speaking his mind. He's good at that. And he's very fearless. And I would like you to maybe share with people how you're a person in power and privilege, but you have chosen to um, poke the hive at every possible uh, opportunity and it's gotten you in trouble and how maybe you could share some of those points on how we can poke the hive and be as successful as you are and some of the things you've said. Uh, yeah, so there's a couple rules for that. So, so first of all, like it is, it's actually coming to respect the privilege that I have. I mean, I was when I first started the equity analysis work in Oakland, I was really concerned about all the potential minds that I could step in uh, as a white guy of privilege. And thinking that I should hold back and allow, you know, allow the people of color, like in, in this sort of patrician way, like you know, allow the people to, you know, speak. And like, no, I have a particular responsibility as the white guy in the room um, with authority um, to hold the space. Like, I have to, like, I'm expected to give permission for people to talk because people listen to me and they don't listen to women or people of color. Like, I gotta make sure that all the voices are heard and that they feel safe. Um, and I have a particularly important role to play with white guys. God, the number of white guys <laughs> that I deal with that are like, you know, they'll have, be having a conversation and then they'll talk about the African-Americans, right? They get like their voice, you know, it's quiet, right? Um, 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 we white people are very delicate. And we don't, we don't like to deal with things that make us uncomfortable, particularly white men. And so they're very well-intentioned, like, you know, super progressive, like nice, equity-oriented white guys who are just uncomfortable on this topic and go into avoidance around it. Uh, and so I have a responsibility as a white guy to um, force particularly other white men to get comfortable having these conversations, or at least to get comfortable with the profound discomfort of talking about the history of our profession, right? And to see their particular responsibility for doing this work, and doing it not in a way that is condescending or, uh, you know, patriarchal, right? Doing it in a way that is simply fulfilling our duty that pity, seeing pity and condescension as another form of white supremacy, right? Don't do that. <laughs> See everyone as equal and that we have a responsibility to close disparities when we failed our people in the past, right? That's it, it's just people and like white guys who've got a particular role. So there's that understanding, but then there's also, there's some technique. There is so much anger and discomfort on these topics that there are, there are really two most important tools that I use in order to bust through that. Um, probably the most important is compassion. Uh, and compassion, again, had like, like there's a you know, big difference between equity and equality. There is no overlap between compassion and pity. Compassion requires that you see yourself as the equal of everyone in the room. Um, and try to understand what it is like to walk in their moccasins. So why is this person so angry? Like, the, you know, there's, there's a person that's terribly angry at me. It's I, avoiding personalizing that and instead asking the question, what is the root of this anger? Like, what's the high ball? And then there's another technique that I use a lot of, and it's quite intentional, and that is humor. Humor is the most powerful weapon for having a conversation about any of these topics. Uh, if I can get people to laugh at me, I might be able to get them to laugh at themselves. And if I can get people to laugh at themselves, I can open minds in a really deep way. So I apply a lot of humor in this work. Um, 
just you know, to, to move the conversation along. But I think the final thing, and this is something that we all need to be comfortable with, is risk taking. Right? The real reason we got so much done in Oakland, you know, and it's partly this, but it's also, also partly that the entire management team in the city is comfortable taking risks in order to act quickly, to be decisive, to be bold, um, to know with some certainty that we're going to make mistakes, that we're going to say the wrong thing, that we're going to create cause offense sometimes, right? And to be skillful about failure. Um, and to know that at a certain point, like in Santa Monica, it was simply time for me to walk away. So that's what I can offer. Other questions? How would you um, advise people of color to talk about these issues? Because, you know, I, mean, I find myself sometimes like, I have to do the reverse thing. So I have to whisper and say, oh, well, yeah, like, white, white folks. Or I have to, you know, like, I have to say, white, white, yeah, white um, uh, supremacy. Or white, like, talking about the disadvantages, I, uh, talking about systemic racism. Even people of color feel comfortable talking about those issues without turning off. Um, very well intentioned, you know, um, uh, white people that um, are working, you know, in this field that are, are trying to do better. That that might, you know, there's that miscommunication, so maybe they might, you know, be um, misinterpreting what we're saying or whatnot. But so, yeah. so, how does that come from, like, person of color? What would you guys advise? <laughs> yeah, I, I I'll just kind of like answer from maybe my own experience, and I think. Um, you know, one actually, I kind of riff a little bit on what Jeff was just saying about compassion and like um, one of the things I've been seeing just working even within my own organization and with my board, it's taken many years to get to the point where everyone was even willing to say equity is something we really need to make a priority. You know, it wasn't generally. And, you know, a lot of times I would just get so angry. You know, I get so frustrated, so angry. It's like you know, that I'm dealing with white folks who have never even thought about difference, let alone inequity, let alone racism, let alone, uh, you know, all of the things we've been talking about. But then also actually finding a way for myself to see, oh, people are really afraid of screwing up. They're really afraid of saying the wrong thing. They're really afraid of, um, that we're failing. I think that there's often a feeling, oh, we as an organization are failing because we can't report, recruit people of color to our board, and, um, and everyone's so worried about screwing up that like no real conversation can happen. And just kind of starting to see, oh, you know, like I'm having, you know, I'll just be, you know, like as a trans person, I'm, you know, feeling I'm not seen, I see feeling like my needs are not getting met, I'm, you know, there's like a million things where I'm feeling kind of embattled. But then just taking that perspective of saying, oh, this person is feeling really afraid right now. Um, and that's underneath part of, it's helpful to me to just tap into that compassion piece even for someone who might be creating a really difficult situation for me. Um, it just helps to open up to kind of get behind where people are are coming from and see that they're actually also suffering. Um, so I don't know, that, that's, my, that's, that's my perspective. So, uh, so I come at this with a lot more privilege, right? Uh, basically, I'm not, from, the work that I did helping to, uh, when I realized that particularly my line managers in the city of Oakland, who were largely Latino and African American, um, no one had ever really told them how to get promoted in an organization, right? That there, you know, there was a certain amount of just kind of basic, white people created this structure and then didn't tell anyone else how it worked, right? So there was a certain amount of, uh, um, identifying mentors for my team that could help them understand how the system worked and how communication works in an organization. Um, another thing that I use a lot of is beards, right? So uh, this is a, it's a gay term. Uh, uh, 
like uh, finding allies and getting them to show up as necessary to validate your work in a hostile audience. So for me, that means having people of color come along and just signal that I'm not uh, a racist jerk. Um, having white people as your allies to support your work uh, and basically be your backup singers can be really powerful. Um, similarly, I think, I mean, simply going back and reviewing um, the work of Dr. King, all of which is 100% valid today, right? The, the strategy that Dr. Martin Luther King and his entire crew used under much more difficult circumstances, but responding to identical human failings that exist today, right? The legal structure was worse, but the human failings haven't changed as much as we might like to think that they have. So it was also something that I, I, I was amazed to watch the people of color in my organization who were able to very skillfully use the techniques that they have clearly learned in their churches and their mosques to carry, uh, to carry themselves with confidence, uh, to be unshakable in the face of hostility. Um, to not, uh, to use anger as the kind of, as a, as a, a energy, a sort of, uh, a base energy that they use to propel themselves forward, but never to use anger as the message. To have the ultimate message be uplifting, to point all of us towards our common humanity, right? Um, there are, I love watching the things that the people of color in my organization could say that I couldn't, and observing the things that I could say that they couldn't, um, and teaming up with them. So another thing that I think is super important is finding those people of color who have figured out how to thread the needle, uh, and it varies very much by gender. So um, there's a lot of stuff that the black women in my organization could say that the men just like didn't have, were not permitted that space. So finding other black men who are carrying this message in a way that's authentic and effective, super important, and then doing the work necessary to train others to, you know, to learn from like, you know, what's the message, what's the approach, what's the mind state that really moves the ball forward. And also recognize that there are many different approaches, right? I mean, you know, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King were like, they were a nested pair. Um, there's not just one approach. It needs to be authentic to you. Um, so, as a pure woman of color, this is really frustrating for me to hear, honestly, because I feel like I don't really have patience and that we don't really have time. So I sort of just like fell into this world. This is not somewhere where I was like, I want to do transportation planning, I want to like lobby the Sacramento doing like bike advocacy world. Like that's not why I plan for my life, but here I am. I do this for a few years. And I feel like what I'm hearing right now and what I see a lot is that queer folks, women, and people of color need to bring the people in privilege, white folks along and have to like help and like sort of drag them through to get to where we are now. Mm -hmm. And I see this time and time again in San Francisco that we can't talk about homelessness we can only talk about homelessness in bike advocacy world when it's like on a bike path. We can only talk about fines and fees when we're talking about traffic enforcement. Um, so I just sort of want to refute a little bit of what you're saying. And as people in a lot of power in this world, you know, how do you respond to the impatience that people who don't have power feel in this room? Um, you're spot on. Uh, this work really pisses me off, uh, and I can't believe that it's friggin' 2017 and we're still having these conversations. Uh, that said, um, I think there, there are two interrelated topics, uh, and this is similar, again, to the work that was done back in 1964. One is the structural change, like all of the little policies that are so screwing us over um, that it requires, uh, you know, dorky data-oriented people to just go in and fix. This stuff can happen quickly and needs to happen quickly um, because society is ahead of where the rules are now. 
The work of changing society, however, is slow. Um, and as Dr. King regularly said, does not follow a straight line. Um, and it is a particular burden of queers and women and, particular, and people of color to lead in this. Um, and you know, speaking as a queer guy, I like, I am, I have a lot of very deep-seated anger um, that, like, I still have to do this work, but I know it needs to be done. And as a white guy, I know that I have a voice that is particularly important in changing the minds, opening the minds of other white men. Um, I wish that I didn't have to do it. Um, and I am so grateful for all of the support that I've gotten in this work, um, including from many of you in this room, right? Um, we're all, um, in fact, you know, and I, and I should acknowledge, like, this rate white guys in the room. Uh, you ride bikes, right? You know what it's like to be made to feel less than. Um, now, being somebody on a bike who's also a woman of color, that's a completely different world at a completely different level. And yet, at the root of it is being dismissed as a person. We all need to do the work to not allow our society to dismiss the personness of anyone. And I think, you know, having, recognizing as bike advocates that the thing that drives us, you know, as for our bike issues, is not that dissimilar from the much deeper and more profound and horrifying ways in which women and people of color um, and people um, of different sexual orientations and sexual orientations and gender identities have to suffer. But you know, may that work as a cyclist teach you compassion in order to see um, the common humanity of all of us. Um, I, I want to make sure we're not making it all equivalent, the experience. Yes. yes. Uh, I just want to, I know you mean Please that, I'm just going to call that. that out. Yes. That you're not saying many, it is an equivalent Many experience. orders of magnitude, you know, different. Because you get off the bike and you're a white man. Yes. And, <laughs> and people of color never get to exactly. get off the bike. Right, and as a, and as a queer guy. So to speak. <laughs> right, and as a queer guy, like, part of, part of the weirdness of being a queer white man is I have the option of hiding the thing that, uh, you know, society hates me for, right? I mean, it, this, the, you know, and I think it's actually one of the reasons why, um, you know, because privilege is so tantalizingly close, uh, that uh, it, it's, it's certainly very much one of the motivators of why I've gotten into this equity space, because I almost had it. <laughs> the thing I just want to add, um, Janice, are you still back there? Okay, okay, good, good. Um, I just want us to all, as a movement, or at least there's maybe a couple hundred of us of the movement in this space, I just want us to all really collectively um, hold the way that we are externalizing this anger and frustration onto the people of color in, in our space and, um, and are burning them out. Yep. Like, I just want us to really take responsibility for that right now, at least in this room, if we can. We are burning out the people of color in our movement, on, on our staffs. And, um, and the people who step up into leadership don't last long. And we see that over and over and over again. And, um, you know, just for me, being an executive director, I've seen only a small handful of other POC executive directors in the seven years I've been in this role. And they, and they don't last, you know, usually it's a year or two. Tamika was with us for three years. I know you all listened and took in what she said, but she's not, and she's not here to keep that going. Um, and so someone else has to step, in, step into that space, but we gotta look at the work we're asking those people to do. Um, and I think you all know the concept of emotional labor. All of the emotional labor that, go, that women do, that POC folks do, that queer folks do, and that's something that's that's benefiting all of us, and we need to find a way to take responsibility for that as a group, and see that, that recognize that work when it's happening, 
um, pay people what they need to get paid, uh, make sure that we are doing everything we can to support the folks who are stepping up and taking on that work and holding that anger and frustration and moving our whole movement forward because otherwise we're going to just keep losing them. 